All right, everyone. Welcome into Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football on a Monday night at seven o'clock Eastern time. It's six o'clock Eastern time. Let's not jump ahead of ourselves. Six o'clock Eastern time uh, here to talk some college football. See a number of people around the line. Good to see you. A number of people have already commented in the live chat. We will get to you very, very soon. Uh, my intent tonight, in addition to taking your phone calls, is to run through the video that I posted just a few days ago with my 1 through 130 FBS rankings for the 2019 season and to respond to your reaction on my complete rankings. Of course, each and every week during the regular season on Sunday, following uh, Saturday's games, we release our top 25 that actually makes sense. Uh, but uh, following the season for the second straight year, after the championship game, I look it all over and rank all the teams one through 130. So I hope you've had a chance to check out the video. I list them off one through 130 and uh, then await your comments. So there's a number that, um, let's see, how many comments? We got. Uh, we only got 15 comments in. So if you've got any comments on the rankings in particular, but we're wide open to talk college football, whatever you want to hear. Uh, number is 860-325-3687. Let's get that number on the screen. First and foremost, there you go. 860-325-3687. My focus is going to be on your reaction to my final 1 through 130 rankings for 2019. We have recently released a uh, conversation on Alabama, Nebraska, USC. We've got Oregon and Miami talk coming up tomorrow. Florida State Live tomorrow night, Tuesday night at 7 o'clock Eastern time. Posted a video the other day on Travis Etienne's assault. And now that he's coming back to Clemson on the ACC and the national record book in rushing and touchdown scoring. I am about to finalize. There's a big list of it right there. I almost forgot one game that I desperately wanted to get in there, and I completely forgot about it from 2014. But these are my top 25 games of the decade. My top 25 games of the decade. And again, there's a game from 2014 that I almost blew, almost missed it, but I remembered it. And it was a three-point game, and quite the game it was. The Super Chat's on if you'd like to contribute to the channel here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. But again, the call-in number is 860-325-3687. I'm going to check out the live chat. Then I'm going to my comment section on the video posted on the final rankings for 2019. Anakin, you made it. You're in. Whole stream. You can catch us start to finish. It's good to see you. George is here bright and early. We'll have three losses when they play Florida in 2020. Georgia will have three losses when they play Florida in 2020. And of course, the Gators are going to win that game. So that's four losses for Georgia. Going down, down. They are going down, down. They're going down, down. That's a Bruce Springsteen song from the Born in the USA album. Going down, down. I'm going down, down. Uh, thanks for keeping us posted, George. You got to get, take the call from the brother. If it's mom, you definitely need to take the call. I don't know if it's your brother. I, I would think that we would take precedence here over your brother. 904 hurricane. Shh. It's all about the you. We've got good kill one on the line. Clemson alum 98, good to see you as always. Florida, Bama in 2020 SEC championship game. Mark it down. Oh, that's another video I need to cut. Thank you so much, Clemson alum 98. Uh, when am I going to get to that one? I believe I did this last year in the offseason. I took my 2018 predictions and then I compared them to the results to see how close I was and see how close the records were. I need to do that. Prediction versus results. Got to get to that. Clemson alum 98, you just reminded me. I don't know how, but it did. Anakin, 
And we encourage everyone to like the video. Jay Jobs doing a nice job of always reminding everyone to like the video. Matthew Braz is on the line. Good to see you. Clemson alum 98. The OBJ cash handouts is still being investigated very much an open case. Not heard too much more on that. Nine oh four hurricane. I think Alabama should have been in the playoffs over Oklahoma and was the fourth best team in the nation coming from someone who hates Bama and yes, even without Tua. So Bama did not earn it. Nine oh four hurricane. I completely agree with you that Alabama is better than Oklahoma. So if we're looking for the best teams in the country and we want to make it completely subjective and just say, hey, whose power, whose hands are we going to place all the power in to make this selection for the college football playoff? If they want to put it in my hands and say, Mark, you don't have to justify anything. Just, just select the four best teams. I said this many times, Ohio State, LSU, Clemson, Alabama. It wouldn't have been justified. It wouldn't have been right. Wouldn't have been earned. Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football. Who's on the line? It's Matt, Mark. Hey, Matt. What's up? Okay, so your final rankings. Why is Texas A&M ranked above Texas? Obviously, I'm biased okay. but because I'm a Texas fan. But are, what is A&M's best win? They only had one win over a team with a winning record the whole year, and that came to the bowl season. Um, I would say there that we have two teams that went 8-5. and five. And I would make the argument that Texas A&M had a much tougher schedule than Texas. Texas A&M didn't I would agree with that. also didn't lose to the likes of a TCU team that went five and seven. Okay, but shouldn't we also be counting their wins? Absolutely. I, mean, I, I think Texas has better wins than Texas A&M at this point. All right, so your best Texas wins are who? Who did Texas beat? Uh, we, we, oh, that we beat that same Oklahoma State team with Spencer Sanders and Tylen Wallace, and then we beat Utah in the bowl game. Yeah. And then from there, I'd have, I'd have to rack the memory. I'm trying to think. Yeah, there. well, I'm trying to think, too, and I'm, I'm not going to sit here and go through the, the – Those to look are two best ones. I'm not saying we – I mean, we're debating 23 and 20 or so. I mean, we're down the list. I'm not saying I'm we with you. Yeah, I think the highest we should be is 20. Matthew, I don't, I'm mad. I don't have any issue with it. I'm, uh, I'm here to debate these things. That's why we do these things. So I, I don't, I don't have any, I don't have any issue with you questioning my rankings. I, I never uh, have publicized my rankings to be perfect. Just said that they're, they're logical. There, there's thought given to it. All right. So Texas, let's, let's, let's pull up the. Uh, I should be able to do this off the top of my head, but it's just not working today. I guess. Um, they're giving us the 2020 well, we schedule. Tech was the first game. LSU. Uh, and then that, it goes blank for me. I tried to predict the rest of the season. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. All right. Uh, we can even count Louisiana Tech as a decent win, like a top 50 win. They won that game by 31 points. Uh, beat Rice. Beat Oklahoma State by five. Beat West Virginia. They were no good. Beat Kansas. They were no good. Barely beat Kansas. So... If you listen to my uh, explanation while I rank the top 25 teams during the season, I'm going based on results, uh, and then I'm basing it on the performance, too. So had they beaten Kansas 50 to nothing, I would rank that to be, uh, and I'm not saying this made the difference in the rankings. I, I'm not claiming that at all, but I'm just stating that the performance does come into play. Uh you know, if they're a 25 point favorite against Kansas and they only win that game 52 48 or 50 to 48 on a last second field goal, they should take a little bit of a hit for that. Okay. They lost by 10 to TCU. They beat Kansas State. That's a decent win. They, they lost to Iowa State, who went seven and six. Uh, they lost to Baylor by two touchdowns. So that's pretty much of just a neutral result. And they beat Texas Tech. So the best wins for Texas. Oklahoma State by five, an eight and five team, and Kansas State, another eight and five team. They beat them by a field goal. Those are their two best wins. 
Yeah, but just looking at A and M schedule, they don't have very good or very many wins either. I think their best. No, they don't. Win was Oklahoma State in the bowl game. Uh, yes. That and would be the best them win. With their quarterback healthy and their wide receiver out. Their best wide receiver healthy. Okay. Well, I wasn't exactly dissecting all of that at the at the moment, but yet I I gotta say Texas A and M beat. Uh, yeah, they, they didn't beat any good teams, Oklahoma State. So so their best win is Texas's best win. It's the same win. Yeah. And then after that, Texas beat a Kansas State team that went 8-5, and five, and Texas A&M didn't beat anyone but Mississippi State who won six games. Um, but and Texas Kansas State A- beat Mississippi State. <laughs> if you want to use transitive property. Sure, sure, and we can. Uh, but Texas A&M also did not lose – to Iowa State, the Oklahoma loss is no shame in that. Uh, Texas A&M got rolled. I'm gonna I'm gonna make your point. I'm going to uh, make your argument for you that LSU, of course, barely beat Texas and they steamrolled Texas A&M. But my goodness, Alabama, Clemson, Georgia, LSU, those are four heavyweights on the schedule, and then Auburn. Oh, no, I agree. They played a way tougher schedule. I'm just saying when it comes to wins-wise, I think we have the better wins. But, yeah, I agree. Their losses are way better than ours. And they didn't lose those games uh, down to the wire, but aside from the LSU loss, they were pretty respectable showings. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the Clemson game, I think, was a little – it was – Pretty much a blot. They scored a garbage time touchdown with like a minute left. But it, I yeah, think they, Alabama was close for a half. Georgia was close pretty much the whole game. Yeah. Yep. And then, what were you gonna say? Uh, I, I think that's a pretty fair assessment. Okay, what is your assessment of this LSU team? Uh, where do you where would you rank them in the college football um, all time rankings? Well, based on the way they play defense the final five games, I'd rank them extremely high. I haven't really given it much thought, but uh, I think based on the way they played against that schedule and the way the defense played the back half of the season or down the stretch, that uh, they would have to be extremely... If somebody rated LSU to have the best team this century since 2000. I wouldn't necessarily say the same thing or give them the same ranking, but I couldn't laugh at it or argue with it. There are a lot of advanced metrics that favor what LSU did against that difficult of a schedule as being an all-time great team. No, I agree. I think just in my opinion from, I mean, I'm not that old, but watch just watching football for as long as I have, I would probably say they're the best team I've watched. I mean, they're definitely top three. I would say 01 Miami, 05 Texas, and then them. And then if you want to throw in 14 Ohio State, it was really good too. Yeah, it's a difficult thing to do. It's a fun thing to do. But um, yeah, the most dominant teams, most dominant teams of the 2000s. Yeah, the 01 Miami team, of course. Uh, the 05 Texas team, I would have to go back and, and uh, really look at that team. Uh, certainly the USC team that annihilated Adrian Peterson and company the year before that, no four, they were dominant. Yeah. And uh, several of the Alabama teams, although they never won a national championship with an undefeated team, ironically, uh, all the Alabama teams had one loss that won a national championship. And I'm not as high on this Florida State 2013 team as a lot of people are. I'm not high on that team at all. I just feel like they had a really, really good quarterback and then a couple okay pieces around him. I don't think they were that great. Yeah, and they never really played anyone that good. Yeah, I think that 18 Clemson team is underappreciated, too. That defense is really, really good. That front four is probably the best uh, front four in the last 20 years. Yeah, and for them to um, face an Alabama team that had just shut out Mississippi State and LSU and uh, put up 44 points on that defense is pretty remarkable. 
last question I got for you. What are your um, opinions on De'Ara King's transfer to Miami? What does it do for the program? Well, he's got a track record that the other two guys in the room don't have. Uh, he's played at an extremely high level. He's accounted for over 50 touchdowns in a season uh, in the American Conference, which is the sixth best conference in the country. Uh, so he certainly can play there. And uh, I would think that he would be the favorite to win the job. Uh, the other two guys, regardless of their skill set, Williams and Perry, have not succeeded nor played anywhere close to his level of football. And neither one's the dynamic runner that he is. Yeah, Tate Martell really ended up being a bust. I thought he was going to be better than that. Yeah, he certainly must not have impressed anyone or played well uh, when it was time for him to show up in practice. But just to see him throw a couple passes against Louisiana Tech, um, what was reported to be Tate Martell's deficiencies look like his deficiencies in just a couple throws. Uh, he doesn't throw a, a tight spiral. He doesn't throw a really good, he, he, he's just not a passer um, as quarterbacks go. And that's, uh, in my book, a huge liability. Uh, I don't know why he came out of high school as a five-star. I think we just, the talent surrounding him, he went to Bishop Gorman, if, I, if I'm thinking yes. right. Yes. I mean, I know they're a power powerhouse, so I'm sure he had all types of talent around him. Absolutely. But uh, the scouts and the coaches should be able to look past that. Yeah, that's true. And then I have one last small question. Who are you rooting for in the Super Bowl? Who am I rooting for? That's a great question because I definitely had a rooting interest yesterday. I was rooting for the Packers. I knew that they were going to get annihilated, uh, but I was rooting for them. I like Aaron Rodgers. Uh, in the AFC game, I just wanted to see a good game, and so I was satisfied with that outcome. I don't necessarily like or dislike either one of those teams. On the Super Bowl, who am I rooting for? I, I don't really have a rooting interest. If anything, Andy Reid seems like a really great guy. And he's been in the business so long and been close. So uh, Kyle Shanahan should have more opportunities down the road. So that might sway me slightly Kansas City's way. Okay. Thanks for taking my call, Mark. Hey, thanks a lot, Matt. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. So we appreciate that Matt has looked at the uh, final rankings, 1 through 130. Had an issue with Texas being ranked at 23 and Texas A&M at number 20. A lot of people took exception throughout the season of me continuing to rank Texas A&M. I didn't the entire season in the top 25, but there were certain points in the season in which I thought that they had done enough and played reasonably well enough against those powerhouse teams to warrant a ranking. Uh, I'm going to get to, again, the comments in the live chat, but also combine that with the 15 comments that were left. I thought there were a lot more than that. But anyway, just 15 comments left in the comments section of the video of the rankings. So Luke Walker wants us to talk about North Carolina. I cut a video, Luke. Please check it out. I don't have my notes on North Carolina. What can I say is that going into last season, I ranked the coaches in the ACC and I ranked Mac Brown as the second best coach in the conference. Even though he had not stepped on a field for six years, I believed that he was still that good or maybe coupled with the coaches in the ACC, not necessarily being as good as in the other leagues. And look what he did. They played every game down to the wire. They took Clemson down to the wire more so than any team in the country the entire season. Uh, and now coming back in 2020, wow, Sam Howell is a legit top five to 10 quarterback in the nation through 38 touchdowns as a true freshman. They've got Javante Williams and the other kid at running back. Why can't I think of his name? Wow. How quickly they forget. Whew. Can't think of the other North Carolina running backs name. Anyway, the two running backs are coming back. I like both of them. Daz Newsom at wide receiver. Deyame Brown at wide receiver. Bo Corrales, their top three wide receiver threats, are back. They lose their center. Heck, they get the other four offensive linemen back. Again, if you want a detailed rundown, Luke, look up the video. 
North Carolina. I just shot it about two weeks ago, just coming off the heels of watching them demolish Temple in that bowl game. And I ran down the offense and the defense and why I'm high on North Carolina next season. We got to find somebody to challenge Clemson. Hey, it's Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football. Who's on the line? What's up, Mark? It's DeAndre. How you doing today? Hey, DeAndre. We just had somebody comment on North Carolina for 2020. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, I'm doing a, my own thing with the ACC because, you know, I don't don't have as much representation as uh, other channels. The other, other, uh, hold on one second, Mark. You with us, DeAndre? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I got you, DeAndre. You're fading a little bit, but uh, yeah, I like the I like uh, North Carolina for next year. Yeah, I, I don't know either, Quentin Harris. I, I think he is. Yeah, and then uh, the quarterback that's at Wake Forest is going to take it over to Newman. I think he transferred. He's going to be pretty good. I think he has to start the series. But I think the reason why Newman got out of there outside of wanting to play more talented teams to show his ability, I mean, those two tall receivers are gone next year. Uh, so, I, I, uh, so this is going to be an interesting time. Carolina. It's hard to say what they're going to do, but they had a number two recruit class. But the coach there, I don't know how much he cut up with James Madison when he was there. He's going to go get a uh, he's, he's big on the transfer portal and he's big on getting two co players. So I really don't know who he got in on that level. But uh, it's going to be interesting. Uh, Carolina also, they were signed as a quarterback. I think so. I can't wait. They got both running backs back. They've got their top three wide receivers back. Howlett quarterback. I uh, posted a video a few weeks ago. They've got most of their playmakers on defense back. They've got four of their offensive linemen back. They just lose their center, who was their best offensive lineman, but still the other four guys are back. Uh, 
And, and those two games that you mentioned in the non-conference obviously don't hurt them in trying to win a coastal division. That might actually make them better as long as they stay healthy. Well, the difference, DeAndre, between De'Ara King and Tate Martell is that King's proven it. All right, DeAndre. Anything else? Hey, right, let me ask you this. Yep. You saw the early uh, odds come out for the uh, national championship. So I know we both bet in the end. Um, I don't like, I, don't, I can't take close for that two to one. But anybody else out there that you would uh, take uh, just to put the money on? I haven't looked at it, you but. Well, I think Clemson's odds are so good because they play in the ACC. I think that's part of it is that it's just assumed that they're going to be in the playoff to start out with. It's not necessarily so much confidence that they're they're going to win the whole thing, but when you've got almost a certainty that you're going to be in the playoff just to start the betting, that's a huge advantage. Uh, I, I haven't looked at it, but... Um, uh, so I don't, I can't really comment on it because I don't know what the odds are. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I was looking at that too. Oh, and I totally agree with you about the uh, best players and all of them being receivers. Yeah, where's the historically black colleges are in there? Jerry Rice and Walter Payton, two of the best play, you know, football players in NFL history. <laughs> what the HBC is? I mean, Art Shell. Fuck Buchanan. Yeah, but they were only selecting 11. They were only selecting 11 players.
that was the record. I think that's anything better than her walking in. Or uh, I don't know if I'm about to let you go, but uh, there's another guy that had a real good career. I'm trying, I'm trying to think of it. There's a couple other people I, I would have put in there before Herschel Walker. So I liked your uh, show on that. I, I, it was very interesting. All right, DeAndre, I appreciate that. All right, DeAndre. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, so I actually wanted to go a little bit more in depth on the players that were selected uh, by a blue ribbon panel for status as the top college football players of all time as announced at the national championship game. So we started to get into it last night and then the conversation went elsewhere uh, but it struck me, number one, odd that in a team sport where there are roughly 10 positions, a quarterback, running backs, wide receivers, tight ends, offensive linemen, defensive linemen, linebackers, and defensive backs, not even distinguishing corners and safeties, and then not even counting special teams, that you would select 11 players and nine would be running backs doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. And then just to, to, to look at the careers of some of those players, I think they're legend and I think their NFL exploits had more to do with their selection than what they did collegiately. I also think again, as I debunked on a number of fronts last night that the Heisman trophy gives an individual who wins it way too much weight, way too much weight. As soon as somebody has Heisman trophy next to their name, then they are pretty much given a free pass as just one of the great players of all time. And certainly if you win the Heisman trophy, you most likely had one of the best seasons of any player or any quarterback, running back wide receiver that particular season. But this would be a great series to go through each and every Heisman Trophy winning season and really grind down to the players that did not win and some of the better performances that they had and that some of these Heisman Trophies are really in question, especially when you go back to the 50s and 60s. Some of them are just a mystery. And again, in the year of 1975, Archie Griffin ran for 1,450 yards and four touchdowns. His teammate, Pete Johnson, is known for running in the one and two yarders from the goal line. He scored 25 touchdowns. Well, if that were the case, he would have run for what? 150 yards? No. Pete Johnson ran for over 1,000 yards. In 1975, over a thousand yards, only 400 less yards than Archie Griffin. And he scored 25 touchdowns to Griffin's four. That's a bit of a questionable Heisman Trophy award. I'm assuming that uh, JM503, JM503 is asking where I had Oregon ranked in my final rankings. That would be at number five. Um, I am going to take the conversation to the comments that were made in response to my 1 through 130 rankings. And it's been so long, I got to sign back in. So here we go. First comment by George. Okay, Georgia lost to the number 53 team at home in front of 92,000 of their fans. Ah, ha, 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 ha. 
Funky Fudge 11, Arkansas at 97, Vandy at 89, the first SEC team and the lowest, of course. Okay. Did Mark just relegate Arky to the group of five? So I think I made a comment about Vandy being the lowest rated SEC team, but I had ranked Arkansas at 97, a little slip of the tongue there, apparently, according to Funky Fudge. Yes, Arkansas, if they keep it up, they should be relegated to the group of five, losing to the likes of San Jose State, Colorado State, North Texas the last two years. Goodness. All right. Citrus Aviation writes, fantastic, full, one to one thirty rankings. I would have swapped Georgia and Oregon for the four spot. Until Georgia's offense improves, there will be no chance for them to win an SEC title. With the team that struggles to score more than twenty four points, there are a lot of teams that can beat them. My team, the Huskers, at I think it was sixty one, seems to be a good spot. The team improved slightly this year, but we still managed to lose the close games. All right, Citrus Aviation, let's keep in mind that um, there's there's offense and there's defense. And in the matchup of the Big 12 and the SEC, Georgia pretty much had their way against Baylor. What was that game, 26-14? 26-14 in that game. Georgia-Oregon, yeah, you can make a case for Oregon. They beat Utah. They beat Washington, an 8-5 and five Washington team, a Utah team that didn't beat anyone. They lost to Arizona State. They lost to Auburn, no shame there. And they lost close to Arizona State, 8-5 and five team. Of course, Georgia had the bad loss to South Carolina, but Georgia also beat Texas A&M, Florida, Kentucky, Tennessee, Auburn. So, yeah, I got to go with Georgia. I'm good with my selection of Georgia at four and Oregon at five, considering that Georgia beat Florida, Baylor, Notre Dame, Texas A&M, Tennessee, Kentucky, and Auburn. Yeah, that's pretty decisive. Georgia, Oregon. Georgia, Oregon. Yeah. I had thoughts of, of moving Oregon down in actually moving Alabama and Florida ahead of Oregon because they just play tougher schedules. They just play better teams. Yes, and must have been a lot of work putting together a ranking list like this. Great vid. George, first and go Gators. Jordan Callahan, this is awesome. Premier Youth Theater, great work. Can't agree more. As a Knowles fan, it hurts, but numbers don't lie. I do see the potential with the new staff to have the largest national leap from 59. That's where I had Florida State at 59, Miami at 58. To a solid top 25 next year if things fall right. Mark Harmon with an interesting... That Mark Harmon? Mark Harmon with an interesting uh, question that I really can't answer off the top of my head because he's asking, where would you slot North, Carol North Dakota State on this list? So I'd have to go back first and foremost and see who North Dakota State played in the group of five and in the power five this year. They typically fare well. I know at one point they had won five consecutive games against the power five. And we'd have to start there. I would think that North Dakota State is a top 90 team. Top 90 to 100, something in that range. Clemson alum 98. Fast forwarded to two to make sure you didn't slip Ohio State in with some officiating commentary and you didn't. Good job. I thought about it. But I stuck to my claim that I ranked the teams based on the results, first and foremost. The results rule. Then I break ties based on performance on the field. So if I've got Penn State here and I've got Michigan State here and they're both eight and four and they pretty much beat the same team. So that's a bad example because they play the same schedule and they play each other. Okay, I'm I'm. I'm uh, I'm looking at Washington, who went eight and four against Michigan State, who went eight and four. 
and I'm comparing them, well, if the wins and the losses are extremely close, then I'm looking at the performance. Was Washington beating those teams in dominant fashion? Were they losing close games to good teams or were they getting blown out? So not every eight and four is created equal when you're doing rankings. If you're the NFL, eight and four and eight and four is the same, but we're doing rankings. So beyond the results, the results are king, but after the results, you've got to analyze and evaluate the performance on the field. So the performance for Ohio State versus Clemson for me was better, but the results say that Ohio State lost to Clemson. So I would not rank Ohio State above Clemson. If you were asking me who's the better team, I would tell you based on the game I watched, Ohio State, and based on the rest of the season. Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football, who's on the line? Hey, Mark, I'm sorry. I had to calm down. Oh, hey, I can I hear you much better. Yeah, I was in a rush when I called. I, I was trying to get it in. But um, did you go back and look at the Clemson and LSU game yet? Did I watch it again? No, I did not. Yeah. Um, because uh, I, and I heard you say this, um, Clemson didn't run the ball enough later on. I think when they cut it down to 28-25, yeah. like the last time Travis Etienne did a shoot running play was like 11 minutes ago. Yep. Well, I saw a, another uh, podcast, and I told them that um, I felt like Clemson DBs uh, towards the end of the game gave up a lot of yards. Um, and that... Uh, I felt, he said the same thing that you felt, that they didn't run Travis Etienne enough. But I said, I, I felt the safety should have dropped their, uh, should have went back and played coverage to help out. That's why I asked, did you go back and watch any of the game and how did you feel about that? You know, DeAndre, if I had more time and uh, we were doing this full time, you know what I would love to do? And I think about this all the time. I would love during right. the off season to go through the big games from last season and shoot. I would love to go through the North Carolina pit game. I'd go through any game, but we'd start with the big games and show them on a, on a monitor behind me and just talk about them. Just let the game run, maybe cut it down to like a 30 minute version and just talk about it and look at it again. That would be great. Would love to do that. But no, I have not yeah. watched the national championship game again. And I, I haven't either. But I mean, I thought LSU dominated, and and I, I thought it was Venables, you know. Uh, uh, I'm not saying his fault because he's not out there playing. He just designed to defense. But uh, but I just felt like he should have dropped the safety back after um, that first. Uh, AJ Terrell gave it that first uh, yep. catch to uh, that long ball to. But um, also. Um, you talk about the 150 years of football, and I heard you talk about the pole. Did you see how they were saying, like, like I think it's called a Dickey pole back in the 20s and 30s, and how some of the poles were regional, and that's why you had so many before the AP had came along, oh, okay. and they would vote on re to give championships, like Michigan. <laughs> it was crazy. The, the polls that used to go on. I know you talk about let's, let's have a. Uh, 18 playoffs and stuff like that. But it was so interesting how these teams picked their national champions back in the day based on where they located. And like a, they had like a times table and all these calculations. And, and they were just saying they, people were just picking champions out of the blue. <laughs> it's like, you know, like a, one thing I always make about Michigan. If you go look at Michigan's championship in 1901 or something like that, they played 13 games, and a couple of those games was against uh, um, the School of Surgery. I'm like, what? How can it be a real national championship? And then, and then in 19, a couple of years later, they won a national championship. They had to play six games. And there was no World War Two or World War One going on and stuff like that. It's just amazing how they picked pick those games back then. And the national championships, you know, which make us call them blue blood. And I, um, so it's just amazing. I was wondering, did you catch that about the polls and uh, how they really picked their teams last year? 
I Back didn't. In the day. I didn't. I know that when uh, Minnesota was winning all these games and breaking records for wins in the program's history that I went back to the 19, I think, whatever year it was, that they won more games this year than they had since, I think, 1907, uh, something in that range. And I went back, and they played two high school teams that year and beat them like 125 to nothing. (laughs) Another one I brought up was um, one of Joe Paternal's undefeated teams. Mm -hmm. But it was undefeated, and uh, I think Alabama lost one game that year. So they were just talking about how the championships were, you know, just, you, I know we all still think that it's unfair the way they do it, but it's a little bit more fair when they point out, I don't know what year that was, Alabama State since they're undefeated, but, and Alabama won the national championship, but it's just amazing how they did it. And like they said, sometimes they would even wait for the bowls to get finished. And they would pick the team like Arkansas, and I think it was 68. They uh, won a national championship because uh, Mitch just said they was a national champion, and they lost the bowl game. <laughs> it was just, so you know. Oh, I, yeah. I just wanted to do that catch. And, uh, and, and I tend to pick on yeah. Alabama, and they're the easy target because they've claimed all these national championships. I think they're up to seventeen. Uh, but Ohio State did right. the same thing in nineteen seventy. Uh, they they there were polls out there that. Uh, awarded Ohio State the 1970 national championship. They were undefeated, but then they went and lost the Rose Bowl to Stanford and Jim Plunkett. So, right. yeah, it makes no sense. And and if you remember last offseason, I started that series. I was going to go year by year by year by year, and I went back about seven or eight years, and people didn't seem to be too interested yeah, in it. I thought it was fascinating. Was me. I thought it was fascinating. Yeah, because yeah, because you told me one time, like, I'm personally interested in you, because I, I, I always wanted you to do 1984 and the year that Georgia Tech or Washington was, was 91 when they tied it. Yeah, um, they could have won absolutely. It. Um, that stuff I, all needs to be uncovered. Yeah. People need to understand in 1990 that Colorado shares a national championship and they were given a fifth down that won the game for them. Otherwise, they got two losses and a tie. You know, things like that. Right. It's crazy. And then the funny thing about it is the Illinois team that beat that Colorado team close to beat them by 30 points. Yeah. In the Hall of Fame Bowl. I mean, it's it's just, like you said, it's just amazing because our closer lost to two of the better teams in the country. I mean, the ACC was really good that year. Virginia was really good. Clemson was really good. And Georgia Tech, and Clemson lost to those two teams. That uh, that uh, that uh, that won a national championship. I mean, could, was competing for a national championship. I think Georgia Tech all they did was tie North Carolina in a ten ten game. So you know, but it, it it was just interesting to see that. And I heard you talk about it. But hey, man, I'll let you go. Get some other people a chance to call in. And I, hey, man, I can't wait for the off season. I mean, like like full gear after February the eighteenth and get into the. Uh, what is it called? The, the spring game, so we can have something to talk about. Well, DeAndre, uh, you're inspiring uh, me to go back and start posting videos on on all these old college football seasons and to look at these these rankings and these national championships. Because even the year that Nebraska won it, I mean Miami beat Nebraska, and Miami got awarded the championship. I think Auburn was like, I'm not gonna say it was undefeated, but uh, I mean, I, they were close to it. Um, well, they all year, they Auburn, all lost they one game. Auburn or Texas, yeah, Auburn or Texas. So yeah, there could have been a, a lot of teams that could have been uh pit uh won a national championship oh, sure. that year. I mean, yeah, why Miami? Yeah, so in 1983, yeah. Auburn had one loss, Texas had one loss, Georgia had one loss. All sorts of teams had one loss. Right. Nebraska had one loss. Obviously, they lost the one game to Miami because they should have. If if Tom Osborne wanted to win the national championship that bad, uh, I, I give him a lot of credit for going for two. He could have kicked the extra point and won the national championship. Right. So, but Mark, you have a good night, man. I'll keep on listening. Thanks, DeAndre. I appreciate it.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the kind of stuff I would love to do. I love to dive into history. And we started the series last year. I went back to about 2011, year by year by year. And basically what we were doing is saying, okay, in 2017, Alabama won the national championship. But let's also consider this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. This was decided because of college football being decided by people. People decide who play in the playoff. People decide who played in the BCS championship game. People decided what the polls look like uh, the day after New Year's back in the poll era. People have decided the national champions or people have at least decided who's going to play in the national championship. This is unlike any other sport. Sure, in basketball in the NCAA tournament, people decide who plays in the NCAA tournament, but you're liable to get the top 40 teams in the nation correct if you're selecting 68. (laughs) You're not going to miss it. So the controversies in the NCAA tournament, men's basketball tournament, are at the tail end of the selection. It's, okay, we left out that 19 and 11 team for that 20 and 8 team, and those teams aren't going to win the national championship anyway, so it doesn't matter. All right, man, th- this this tempts me to to start a series to go through these seasons, but nobody watches them. I don't know how many views I got on those, like four or five hundred, and it just doesn't cut it for all the time that it takes. Maybe I'll do a live stream that will just be endless. I'll start a live stream at like six o'clock at night, and I'll just sit here all night, and we'll just go through every season of college football. We are just going to sit here and go through every season and just pick it apart and I'll have like eight people watching me. Maybe we'll do that. All right. I would like to remind everyone that you can contribute to Mark Rogers TV a number of ways, and I will be producing and posting a video in which I will outline how you can help us build the channel. But for right now, the super chat is available to you here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. And uh, if Michael loves out there, I, I got to say that this guy contributes on a regular basis. And, and I have unfortunately missed uh, his last few contributions. Therefore, I've not given him full credit. So Michael Love out there, uh, I don't see your comments anywhere in the live chat. But if you're listening to me or listen to the post once it uh, posts, thank you so much. Also, keep in mind that the Voice of College Football is available on audio. Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. What else is out there? At least those four. And soon to be on Radio.com and on iHeartRadio. Soon to be, not necessarily very soon, but within the next month or two. So again, if you know people that love college football, but maybe don't like to take the time or want to watch the videos, but they like to uh, take in their content audio form, point them to the audio platforms, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes, and they can catch Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football right there. Now, the downfall is you're not going to hear as much as we see here on YouTube because I can only post so much to those audio platforms, but it is available and certainly a way to contribute and um, keep track of Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football and what we do right here. So I believe I've exhausted all of the comments made to the channel except for this one. And this is the one that I wanted to address most of all. And this was the last comment made to the rankings post, 1 through 130. And if you have yet to take uh, in that post, uh, check it out. It doesn't take long to watch it. All the 130 teams in their rankings scroll by. 
David, I will get to your question in just a second. I don't know off the top of my head. All right. It was about 90. I think 86. All right. Doug Arby comments. And Doug loves the group of five. And for a number of you out there, trying to think who you are. I know Doug and uh, there's uh, uh, Freeman. You're out there. You guys pull hard for the group of five. And I love it. But let's bring you back to reality. Doug mentions here, I'm going to have to disagree with a lot of your picks. First off, you really underrated the Sun Belt. Winning five to six games in that league shouldn't be bottom 10 to 15. It was definitely better than the MAC or Conference USA. Possibly. Secondly, you underrate a lot of group of five teams and overrate a lot of power fives. Okay, this is where I take exception. The first comment, I would have to, I got I to gotta admit here, when I ranked these one through 130, basically what I did was, I've got a lock on the power five. I watched them all season. I know who's better than who, or who at least put up the better resume. Then once you start to mix the power five and the group of five, that's where it becomes difficult because we know that the power fives up here and the group of fives like here, but there's an overlap. UCF and Boise state are better than Rutgers and Arkansas and a whole host of teams in the power five. There's an overlap. So where do they start to overlap? I had Memphis ranked at number 17. I believe that's roughly close to what, uh, they ranked in the final polls. Is Memphis really the 17th best team in the country? They gave Penn State a pretty good game. They gave Penn State a really good game up until about 10 minutes left to play, and then they got knocked around a little bit and lost by 14. But they played Penn State really well. Memphis beat Ole Miss by five points. Ole Miss went four and eight. Ole Miss went two and six in the SEC. Memphis beat them by five points. Those are our two data points for what is most likely the best group of five team in the country. That they beat a bad SEC team by five points and they lost to a top 10 to 12 team in the country out of the Big Ten, Penn State, by two touchdowns. But they played them well and played them rather close for almost the entire game. Cincinnati rolled over Boston College in its bowl game, won by 25 or 30 points. Boston College is roughly the 60th to 70th best team in the country, and Cincinnati rolled them. Cincinnati played what might be be the best or the second best or the third best roughly in that range team in the country, Ohio state. And they got annihilated 42 to nothing. Uh, Cincinnati otherwise did not play anybody else. I don't believe in the power five. No, they played UCLA week one. They played UCLA. They won. They, they really were the better team. They were clearly the better team, but UCLA hung around. And I think the final score was like 24, 14. They beat UCLA by 10. And UCLA is about the 75th best team in the country. So that's what we got out of Cincinnati. They got killed by a top three team. They whipped up on a top 60 or 65 team. And they beat a top 75 team. And that's what we've got to go on, basically. So it's difficult. Temple was a very good group of five team that went eight and four, and they lost to North Carolina by six touchdowns in a bowl game. Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football. Who's on the line? Hey, Mark. It's McD Sports 4. How are you doing? McD, what's going on? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. I just noticed that you're on, that you were online, and you are online last night as well, but I was busy doing other things, so I couldn't make it. You're allowed. But, um... <laughs> but, um it's the off season, Mark. So you're gonna hear all these uh, delusional predictions. Yep. So, um, I'll get the party started um, on that. Okay. Mail is going to seven and five next year, and hopefully we can get to eight wins with a bowl game. You think that's delusional? Seven and five. 
from Maryland. Let's rewind one year, McD. So Maryland in 2018 was coming off what they do five and seven probably. Uh-huh. Found right? Yeah, five and seven in 2018. Of course, had that one point overtime loss to Ohio State. Otherwise, they would have made a bowl game. And so there was a lot of hope coming into 2019. What did you predict the Terps to do in 2019? Eight and four. Okay, that's right. That sounds right. I remember that. Uh, I had them going six and six, and they went what four and eight? Correct. Three and nine. Three and nine. <laughs> three and nine with one big ten win. Yes. At least we beat Rutgers. And they lost to Temple. Everyone else. So that means uh, Temple. Well, that means they went well. Okay, that means they went two and one outside the conference. Okay, they lost to Temple. They beat Rutgers like everybody else did. And now you've got them vaulting to seven and five, which would include them going what in the Big Ten? Five and four? Um, in the Big Ten, I have them going uh, four and five. I think we're going to really beat West Virginia. Okay, so you're going to win all your non-conference games. So they're going to vault from one win to four wins in the Big Ten. Who in the world are they going to beat in the Big Ten? That's their problem. I think they're going to be... They're going to be Michigan State at home. They're going to, I think they. Let me pull up the schedule. I, I have it all written down, but just as a reference, they're going to be Michigan next year. They were very not Michigan, Michigan State, in my opinion. They're going okay. to be Michigan State. They um came very close to beating them last year in the final game. I think they beat them this year in the final game. Rutgers, obviously. I think we go on the road and beat Northwestern. And we either beat Wisconsin or Minnesota at home, one of those two. Really? Yeah. Okay. The Rutgers win, of course. Uh, I would say that you've got a shot at beating either Indiana or Michigan State. Okay. Uh, and no, then, I think we're losing to Indiana. Then the Northwestern game. Okay. Uh, the I, I'm going to hold you to three wins tops in the Big Ten. I can't see Wisconsin or Minnesota losing to Maryland. I can. Especially Wisconsin. Wisconsin's losing Jonathan Taylor. Yeah. That's their whole offense. What's going to be the offense cool. next season? Wisconsin was winning 10 and 11 games way before Jonathan Taylor showed up. There's a big question mark with Wisconsin's offense. They have no quarterback. The Alex Kahn guy is not very that good. Jack Cone. Uh, and Jack Cone. <laughs> Glad I say Alex Cone. Alex Kahn is what I heard. Uh but Jack Cone. Um I don't think he's good at all. Minnesota, I don't think I I'm gonna come out and say right now, I don't think Minnesota will win ten games um next this upcoming season. Um, I think last year was a uh, fluke. I think they'll win eight or nine, though. Well, there's nothing wrong with winning eight or nine games if you're Minnesota. Yeah, I don't expect them to continue to win 10 and 11 games every year. Yeah, so I just... And and we're coming off a bye after Minnesota. That's also another reason why I throw that one in. In the end, it's a tough team to figure out. We could go in there and beat them, but... I mean, it won't surprise me, but I marked us down for a loss in that one because we've been close the previous two years to them. I just don't know if we could go in there and beat them. I mean, we could beat them, though, in the end. I, I agree with you there. I just... I marked that one down as a loss, and I think we'll either probably pull off an upset as Minnesota or Wisconsin. I don't care that Ohio State is the home team. Uh, it, excuse me. I don't care that we're home against Ohio State. We're losing that one. On the road to Michigan, I think we lose that one, and then Penn State will lose. But outside of those three games, Ohio State, um, Penn State, and uh, Michigan, I really give us a shot against Everybody else on our schedule. All right. Well, unless I see something uh, during spring football that gets me excited about the Terps winning more than two games in the Big Ten and two games at a conference, I got 
I got to estimate four wins and with a ceiling of six. That's harsh, Mark. Why is that harsh? They just went three and nine. (laughs) Let me make one more other argument. Mike Lossley's in year two. Usually at coaches, they don't do as well in their first year. Mike Lossley's in year two. Yeah, it was a rough first year for Lincoln Riley and uh, Ryan Day. That's Those sure. are outliers. <laughs> I know. Outliers. Uh, Chris Kleiman at Kansas State had a nice first year at eight and four. But Kansas State, I, I think Kansas State, is, they expect 10 minutes seasons of a year at Kansas State. I think that's kind of the expectation there. Sure. I mean, look at, look at, um, I mean, the only three outliers you can really tell me are Dan Mullen, Ryan Day, and Lincoln Riley. I think those are really the only like, big time three outliers. I mean, look at Coach Orgeron. He just won a national championship this year. He came in at the intro, but in uh, 2016, 2017, where did he go? Nine and four? And yeah. And they were expecting to win championships there every year at LSU. So. Just to keep that one in mind, I, and I, I'm, I know I've been a bit critical of Mike Lockwood at times. I do think he knows what he's doing. And, and one other argument, talent-wise, Mayo was born on the top 25 talent-wise, so they should um, really be in a lot of these ball games. Possibly winning a lot, possibly winning, um, like, um, some of them, but that's just my two cents. Um, I'll give you another bold prediction um, while I'm on the phone because um, I'm getting called to do some other things. I think that Tennessee goes into for- goes into that Florida game in week four and beats them. Okay. So that's what I'm thinking right now, but uh, Mark, I gotta go because people are bugging me, but um, <laughs> I'll stay in touch and everything. Thanks, take my call and go chirps. Thanks a lot, McD. We appreciate the call, man. Oh, our man McD being called to do other things, but uh, we're here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, and always appreciate uh, our Terp fan McD chiming in with a proclamation of seven and five for Maryland football here in 2020. Of course, he predicted them to go eight and four last year, and they went three and nine. So, based on that track record, his seven and five prediction should produce two and ten. Good evening, Gator Hater, Knoll Nation, Knoll Nation. Tuesday night is your night, seven o'clock Eastern time. We talk Florida State football at Florida State Seminoles live right here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. So please join us then. All right. We have posted in recent days uh, a Nebraska and USC football update where you get uh, discussion on personnel losses, who's going to replace that personnel moving on to the NFL. Early enrollees, what is their impact going to be? Coaching staff changes at both USC and Nebraska as well. Talking Oregon football tomorrow. We will also have Miami football posted tomorrow as well. Uh, I've gotten a request in the live chat to rank the new head coaching hires during the offseason. I'll try to get to it. What I've been trying to get to here before I take a little time off is my top 25 games of the decade. Also, my conference players of the year, both offense and defense. I posted the Sun Belt Conference today. I have recorded the MAC and the Conference USA Players of the Year, and I've got many more to go, of course, all 10 conferences. Uh, posted a couple days ago when Travis Etienne announced his uh, decision to stay at Clemson, that he's assaulting the record books at both the ACC and on the national level. I want to run through, and something Clemson alum 98 mentioned that uh, reminded me, my predictions for 2018, for 2019, yeah, for 2019 versus what actually happened. Uh, 
So I got to get to that as well. There's just too much to do, too much to do. And if people would watch them, as DeAndre and I were talking about, I would love to go season by season through college football history and really outline, see, we see a champion. If you go to Wikipedia and you look up college football national champions and you see 1984 BYU, and let's say you're 30 years old and you know nothing about BYU winning the national championship and what transpired in 1984, just think, okay, 1984, BYU won the national championship. Well, there are some fascinating results, context to that season that would give better insight into how BYU won the national championship, whether they deserved to win the national championship, and maybe who else deserved to be considered as national champion just as much as BYU. Can anyone in the live chat tell me who BYU in 1984 defeated in their bowl game? This is the number one team in the country now. This is the national champion. Who did they beat in their bowl game? And what was that team's record? And because I'm going to go all the way down to the bottom of the live chat, I apologize to everybody that I'm not going to be able to get your comments to the screen because that's how it works. If I want to check out the current status of the live chat, then I can't go that far back. And I'm only up to 656, and it's 713. Uh, nobody really has an answer for me. Why are we talking about BYU J jobs? Uh, NCIS Fanatic 21, Michigan 28-21 in the Holiday Bowl, I believe. Well, your score differentials right on the money at seven points. It was 24-17. BYU in 1984 won the national championship or, more accurately, was voted the national champion after going 13-0. and Yes, Ty Detmer was the quarterback. No, Michigan Dennis was not number 11 in the country. No, they weren't even close to being number 11 in the country. They were six and five. They finished six and six. And that was BYU's opponent in the Holiday Bowl to win a national championship. Those are the kind of things that need to be uncovered and talked about. Because we just look at national champions and say, oh, they won the national championship. In 1990, Georgia Tech and Colorado were voted split national champions. Well, that Georgia Tech team, who did they beat? Who did they beat in their national championship game, which was the Citrus Bowl? Georgia Tech, who played in a decent ACC conference at the time, beat a Nebraska team that was ranked 15th in the country. So that's who Georgia Tech was playing for its national championship. Meanwhile, Colorado finished 10-1-1 in 1990 as national champion, as one of the two national champions. Colorado finished 10-1-1. and And stop me if you've heard this one before, but Colorado was awarded a fifth down. Yes, if you were not watching college football and are too young to know this, there was a game between Missouri and Colorado. They played in the same conference at the time in which the officials miscounted the downs. And this is on the last drive of the game. This didn't happen in the first quarter where somebody could say, oh, well, they scored a touchdown after that. And sure, they shouldn't have scored the touchdown because it was the fifth down. But uh, the game went 34-31. Who knows what would have happened? No, we know what would have happened because Colorado was losing the game with seconds left, and they needed the fifth down to score the game-winning touchdown. Otherwise, Colorado would have finished with two losses and one tie. They, in actuality, did lose two games and tied another game, and they still won the national championship.
Crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy. And uh, in addition to that, Colorado beat Notre Dame 10 to 9 in the Orange Bowl that year. And there was a very questionable call against Notre Dame when Rocket Ismail returned a punt like 85 yards for a touchdown. And Notre Dame was called for clipping or for a block in the back that was extremely questionable. And it saved Colorado's season and a 10 to 9 win against Notre Dame in the Orange Bowl. So for a team that lost a game and tied a game, they really lost three games and tied a game and won the national championship. Yeah, since the is Fanatic 21, Ohio State in 1984 went 9 and 3. They lost the Rose Bowl to USC after beating Michigan and winning the Big 10 at 7 and 2. They lost to Purdue, Wisconsin, in the regular season and then USC. Yes. Nebraska should have beaten Florida State in 1993. So that's a great point there, Matthew. Uh, so there's a game in which you could say, okay, let's give some context to this. Florida State won the national championship, but Nebraska lost on a missed field goal at the gun that would have claimed the national championship for Nebraska. But Florida State still earned a national championship. They still won it. We could say a bounce of a ball, but it was fair. Uh, I really have no dispute there. The dispute in 1993, you know what the real dispute there is in 1993? Tell me if this makes any sense. Florida State beat Nebraska, as was mentioned by Jay Jobs there, 18 to 16. I remember the game well. Uh, Bobby Bowden actually was doused with Gatorade before the game-winning, what would have been a game-winning field goal for Nebraska was attempted because they thought the time ran out. Uh, and the players rushed the field, but no, they had to pull him back. And Nebraska tried an ill-fated, like, 58-yard field goal in which the kid had no chance of making it. So this is in the 1993 Orange Bowl, January 1st, 94. Uh, I usually just state the season in which the game was played, uh, not the actual date. Fumble on the goal line by William Floyd, yes. So... The other point I was going to make about that particular season is that Florida State played Nebraska for the national championship at the Orange Bowl in 1993, and it was not an official national championship game back then. Not until 1998 did we have that. But it was considered this will decide the national champion. Strange that Notre Dame played an extremely difficult schedule that year. Notre Dame played at Florida State in one of these famed games of the century. And Notre Dame beat Florida State by a touchdown, by seven points. Notre Dame the next week lost to Boston College. I don't remember how good Boston College was that particular year. I think they were their typical seven and five, eight and four self. But Notre Dame lost to Boston College on a last-second field goal the very next week, 41-39. Went on and won the Cotton Bowl against the Texas A&M team that was ranked in the top 10. Why didn't Notre Dame get consideration for the national championship? Florida State went 11-1. Notre Dame went 11-1. Notre Dame beat Florida State. Florida State was named the national champion. These are the kind of situations that we have littered through college football history. Thank you, NCIS Fanatics 21. Boston College went 9-3. and three, So there should have been no, no shame in losing to Boston College. And I am certainly, you guys should know this from watching me on a regular basis, Certainly no Golden Domer, lover of the Irish. I love the Irish folks, of course. But the football team, 
I have, I have no affinity toward Notre Dame whatsoever, but why were they not the national champion? This is what I would love to do a series on. And if you go back one year, I did start this series and I thought it was a whole lot of fun. And uh, I know NCIS Fanatic 21 got into it. Uh, he had all sorts of comments to make. But I believe I went back to 2011, maybe 2012. I did not take on the 2011 season, which, of course, could have been and probably should have been Oklahoma State and LSU in the BCS championship game. Not Alabama being given a second chance. 1998, anytime anyone brings up the BCS and how great the BCS was, I immediately go to 1998 and say, oh, yes, the BCS was phenomenal. In 1998, Tennessee went undefeated, and even though it could be argued they lucked into an undefeated record, they were undefeated, fair and square, and should have been playing in the national championship game. But who was Tennessee supposed to be playing in the national championship game? Does anyone out there remember what happened that year? Florida State, Ohio State, Wisconsin, UCLA, Arizona, all had one loss. Kansas State, too, right? Kansas State, six teams. Six teams had one loss. And the BCS was supposed to be the deciding factor on who made the national championship game. So, in the genius of the BCS, it spit out that Florida State, the team that posted the worst loss of any of those teams, Florida State, a 24 to 7 loss to a 6 and 5 NC State team with Tory Holt that that team should go play in the national championship game brutal brutal let's see here I'm going to do a search on my channel to see if I can find these. Huh. 2013. This is not even controversial. Nobody brings this up, but I bring it up. In 2013, my video that I posted one year ago, a whopping 169 views. That's why I'm not doing this series, NCI is Fanatic 21. Sorry, I can't do this series. Nobody's watching them. Uh, so nobody's hardly anybody is as fascinated with this as I am, but in 2013, um, Auburn of course played as a one loss team against undefeated of Florida state for the national championship. Uh, Dennis will get to Penn state. The, the title of my video says 2013 college football national championship review backslash why Michigan State. I probably should have said why not Michigan State. I think that's what I did. Auburn went 12 and one. Michigan State went 12 and one. If you look into the Michigan State loss against Notre Dame on the road, that game was horrifically officiated. Michigan State couldn't breathe on a receiver without getting a pass interference call in that game. That was horrible, horrible officiating in Notre Dame's favor and screwed Michigan State. And that was Michigan State's one loss. Michigan State won a conference in the Big Ten that was very good. Beat Ohio State, an undefeated Ohio State team in the Big Ten title game and finished 12 and 1. Auburn. Lost by two touchdowns to LSU, played an extremely difficult schedule, was probably aided by Missouri emerging from the Eastern Division as the SEC East champ 
beating them. What was the final score of that game? Those two teams put up all sorts of points in that game. It's like 54-41. Uh, Auburn had better wins. Possibly. Possibly they did. We'd have to look into that. Yes, yes, James Scott. Good to see you, James. I'll be awaiting at some point uh, in the next few minutes for James to be encouraging everyone to like the video. James, thank you so much for all your encouragement and everything that you do in helping us here at the Voice of College Football. Uh, Doug, Doug, you did. Yes, Doug, you did miss it because I highlighted you for a good period of time uh, because this is in my uh, this is in response to your reaction to the one through 130 rankings. But uh, I digress. So, Doug, you're going to have to go back and watch the video once it posts. Yes, James, that's for sure. Michigan State got hosed versus Notre Dame that year. All right. You know, let's look up that Michigan State team in 2013 and see who they beat. They went on to defeat Stanford in the Rose Bowl. Mm, I wish I had some rankings. I need some rankings. I need some records here. Let's see what we got. Michigan State in 2013. Here we go. Beat Western Michigan by 13. Beat South Florida by 15. Beat Youngstown State by 38. Okay, the infamous loss to Notre Dame on the road. Number 22, Notre Dame. Number 22 at the time of the game. I'm trying to think how Notre Dame finished in 2013. I think they went like 9-4. and four. Uh, So they lost to Notre Dame by 4. 17-13. to 13. They beat Iowa by 12. They beat Indiana by 14. They beat Purdue by 14. They beat Illinois by 39. They beat number 23, Michigan, by 23 points. They beat Nebraska by 13. They beat Northwestern by 24. They beat Minnesota by 11. They beat Ohio State in the Big Ten Championship game, number two, Ohio State, by 10. And then after the fact, beat number five, Stanford, by four in the Rose Bowl. Auburn in 2013, I'm sure they played a more difficult schedule as Michigan State did not play anyone out of conference that year. That's that's bad. So I'm not saying that Auburn should not have been in the national championship game. I'm just I'm just putting into context that there are other teams involved that once the decisions made by the committee or the BCS formula and the voters that 10 years later, 15, 20 years later, we're sitting there and all we know is who played in the national championship game and don't really know that there were other teams involved that had just as good a resumes. Gator Hater, yes, set your bell. That is the best comment we've seen this entire night. So when you subscribe to Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, please set your bell. That will notify you to all the new content. That's key. Thank you so much. Gator Hater, Auburn in 2013. I used to have a steel trap of a mind that remembered all this stuff, but it, it'll come back to me. Remember that Auburn team, this is the most phenomenal turnaround that I can remember in the history of college football. Auburn in 2012 went 0 and 8 in the SEC, 3 and 9 overall, 0 and 8 in the SEC. Yes, Jay Jobs, the playoff is better than the BCS only because it affords two other worthy teams of competing for a national championship. But imagine. Think of a team that went 3-9 and nine or 0-8 oh or winless in their conference this season playing in the national championship next year. Now, Auburn, of course, was more talented in 2012 than Rutgers is now. I'm not comparing the, the talent on the field. They were, uh, there was a lot of dysfunction for that Auburn football team under Gene Chizik at that point. Uh, they obviously proved the next season that they, they were much more talented then going three and nine and zero oh and eight in the SEC, but just imagine, imagine Kansas or Northwestern this year, 
or Georgia Tech or Vanderbilt or Arkansas going to the national championship game next year. All right. So that Auburn team in 2013 beat Washington State by a touchdown, beat Arkansas State by 29, beat Mississippi State by four. They lost to LSU, who was number six at the time, by two touchdowns on the road. They beat a top 25 Ole Miss team by eight. They beat Western Carolina by 59. So like Michigan State, Auburn did not play anybody at a conference that was any good. Actually, Michigan State's win against South Florida was probably the best win of the two out of conference. Okay, to Auburn's credit, yeah, down the stretch, they played some good teams. Okay, they beat Texas A&M, a number seven Texas A&M team with Johnny Manziel by four. That was a great game. I remember that one. They beat Florida Atlantic by 35. They beat Arkansas by 18. They beat Tennessee by 32. They beat number 25 Georgia by five. They beat Alabama by six. Of course, the kick six game. And then they beat Missouri. I said 55-41, 59-42 in the SEC championship game. And then, of course, played Florida State in an epic BCS national championship game. James Scott coming through again. James, do you need a job? I could use you on the marketing team. My goodness. So James is letting people know. So here's the deal. Here's the deal. I am aiming to build the best possible college football platform for discussion and debate and analysis. I do not claim to be doing that right now. I think I'm close. I think at times we hit the mark. Pardon the pun. Sometimes we we reach that plateau, but I'm not going to say that every day we just deliver the best content possible. But I, I think overall, it's pretty damn good considering the limitations. So anything that you can do to help us build the channel that's like the videos, like, 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 like the videos, just go through the videos and just like them. Please just like them because that pushes them into the suggested videos section on YouTube, the videos you see on the right side of the screen, and that is enormous. Uh, and then, of course, you can contribute financially using the super chat, or I'm going to cut and post a video. I keep saying this. I am going to do it to let you know that there are so many different ways you can help us. You can go to Facebook, just look up Mark Rogers TV, Facebook, just like it. And then you can do whatever you want past that. Anyway, James Scott makes a tremendous point here and he's done it apparently himself. Reasonable Gump said the other day that he shopped on Amazon and used the link in the description section below of any of the videos, it's really simple. Click the link, buy whatever you want, do whatever you want once you click on the link, but just use the link uh, that we provide in the description section. Uh, James has an idea here. This could be a new segment for you, Hitting the Mark. It's a good name. I don't know what then I would do. So, uh, Matthew, uh, I don't know. Maybe this is key as well. Maybe Matthew's uncovering something on YouTube that I'm not aware of, but if you watch the complete advertisements before the videos, uh, that's probably all, uh, it's a great point. That's probably all monitored, monitored by YouTube that if it, all the advertisements get clicked off after one second, then that only counts for so much money versus if you watch the complete advertisement. Yeah, like, 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 like. Doug, I want to see why Tennessee was in Mark's final top 25. That Georgia State loss was awful. It was. It was awful. 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 I watched the fourth quarter of that game. I was watching other games, of course. Tennessee and Georgia State's not on my radar. There are 
15 other games to be watching. But all of a sudden, man, they're losing to Georgia State by two scores in the fourth quarter. Really? I got to see this. Yes. Awful. But what did that Tennessee team do after that? They lost on a fluke play. They still lost fair and square. The officials had nothing to do with it. They lost fair and square to BYU. But that Tennessee team at 0-2 picked themselves up off the turf. And I know you love your Appalachian State Mountaineers that I ranked 18th in the country. They beat Kentucky, a bowl-eligible Missouri team. They beat a South Carolina team by three touchdowns that Georgia couldn't beat. They beat Indiana in a bowl game. I don't have the results right in front of me, but uh, off the top of my head, that's uh, what they did. And they played Georgia, Florida, Alabama. Those are three losses right there. They beat Mississippi State, who went to a bowl game. Yes, to a certain extent, I was rewarding Tennessee for finishing strong. I was rewarding them for finishing strong. Absolutely, I did. <laughs> if I could find a site that would give me their list of games, this is ridiculous. I've Googled this in like eight different ways. I'll just have to go to ESPN. And then, Doug, I will make the point that I need to make to your comment on the video and why I ranked so many power five teams above group of five teams. Tennessee went five and three in the sec. Oh shoot. They're giving me, of course, this year's schedule. All right. Yes, they lost to Georgia State 38-30. Yes, they lost to BYU by three points in double overtime. So that's a loss, but they lost by the narrowest of margins, a game that they had locked away with 15 seconds left and then gave up like a 50-yard play. Fair and square, BYU won the game in Knoxville. Sure. BYU also beat USC. So that's not an awful loss. Not a horrible loss like the Georgia State game. They got whipped by Florida and Georgia. So against FBS teams, Tennessee was 0-4 to start the season. They were 0-4. Then after that, they beat Mississippi State. They beat South Carolina by three touchdowns. They beat UAB, a bowl team. They beat Kentucky. They beat Missouri. And they, after beating Vanderbilt, which doesn't count for much, beat Indiana in the bowl game. Beat an 8-4 and four Indiana team that was a top 25 team from the Big Ten. That's what I went with. I was trying to break ties between Tennessee, Kentucky, and uh, Texas in particular at 8-5. and five. Okay, Doug, here's the deal. I know you love the group of five, and I may underestimate the group of five. I don't believe I do. I, I attempt to make cut this as fairly as possible all the time. That's my aim above anything else. Criticize me, think that I don't know what I'm talking about or that I didn't look at something in particular correctly. Absolutely. Happens all the time with everybody. But believe me, I'm I'm trying to present a fair argument, regardless of the two teams involved or the 130 teams involved. So we're trying to get it right. What I consistently saw in comparing the group of five versus the 
Power 5 is the discrepancy in results and also performance. So the result is the result. Ohio State played Cincinnati. Ohio State won. That's the result. When I say results, I just mean who won the game, who lost the game. When I say performance, I'm then delving deeper into did Ohio State beat Cincinnati 28-21? No, they beat them 42 to nothing. Okay. And that's not the type of game I'm going to. Uh, one of the best three teams in the country against uh, a group of five team. All right. I'm going to games all over the map where very marginal power five teams consistently beat the upper echelon of the group of five. Like Washington who went seven and five in a very marginal, very marginal Pac-12. Washington, who did Washington beat this year? USC. BYU, BYU, USC. Those were really the big Washington wins. They trounced Boise State. They trounced Boise State. Okay, that's only one game. Not a big deal. And the American Conference is probably not the conference to go to, to make my point, because I have great respect for the American Conference and believe that it was after Clemson, every bit as good as the ACC. So Cincinnati lost one non-conference game. That, of course, to Ohio State, 42 nothing. So I'm not knocking the group of five for that loss. Everybody was getting blasted by Ohio State. Okay. UCF lost to Pitt. So one of the five best group of five teams is losing to a Pitt team that almost lost to Eastern Michigan in a bowl game that went eight and five. Temple. Temple was one of the five to 10 best group of five teams. They lost two non-conference games. They lost to North Carolina by six touchdowns and Temple's other loss. I don't remember out of conference. They also lost to, again, I'm going to have to click back like eight times to get to the 2019 results. Temple also uh, give me the 2019 results. Temple. No, they lost to Buffalo. Okay, so that doesn't prove anything. But Temple lost to North Carolina 55 to 13. They lost to a six and six North Carolina team. Now, your team, Appalachian State, of course, beat two power five teams, but Appalachian State was at the very top at the very top of the group of five with only one loss. And they beat North Carolina in a very close game with a blocked field goal on the last play of the game. It's a great win for App State because they're from the Sun Belt in the group of five beating an ACC team. But shouldn't they win that game? They're 13-1. and one. And they're a top 20. We're, we are ranking App State in the top 25. I'm ranking them 18th. They should beat North Carolina. I had North Carolina ranked like 43rd. App State should win that game. But they, they needed a blocked field goal at the gun to win that game. App State beat South Carolina by a score. What was that game? Like 20 to 12 or 20 to 14 or something like that. South Carolina finished 4 and 8. They went three and five in the SEC. I had South Carolina ranked 53rd in the country. App State should probably beat one of the three or four worst teams in the SEC. It's still a great win. And it's a toss up. It's it. They won the game, but if South Carolina and App State play every week, they're probably splitting those games. All right. Who else? Get back to the standings.
And this is when I need a producer who would be able to post all of your, your comments while I'm talking and looking all this stuff up. So we don't have time to go through the entire group of five, but I'm trying to just pick off the best teams. Memphis, of course, lost one game out of conference. That was to Penn State. So Memphis, who basically proved to be the best group of five team this year, lost to Penn State, a top 10 team by two touchdowns. It was a close game. So that's a, that's a fair result. There's no shame in that. Here's, here's my, here we, here we go. Navy. Let's set aside the work and the mission and the purpose of the Naval Academy of which I have great respect. Let's push that to the side. We're just talking football. Once Navy jumped into the college football playoff rankings, I was like, whoa, whoa, did I miss something? What, what's going on there? Who, who have they played? Uh, the answer was no one. They have not beaten anybody. Why was Navy ever ranked? Because they were racking up wins against bad, bad opponents. And they suddenly at some point were like nine and one. So they got ranked. And then they played Notre Dame. Notre Dame is not a world beater. Notre Dame is not an elite, elite team. They're a very good team. They're a top 15 team in the country. I had Notre Dame ranked what? 11th? Very good team. Navy played Notre Dame and got completely annihilated. What was the, what was the score of that? 49 to 7? And so we've got a top 25 team in the group of five, one of the very best group of five team that only lost one game otherwise. They play Notre Dame and they lose by f- six touchdowns. That's what happens between these two levels of football on a fairly regular basis. They lost 52 to 20. I remember at one point in the game, it was 49 to seven. And who else did Navy play? Did they play anybody else in the power five? No, not until they played Kansas state, a good, a decent Kansas state team, a team that I ranked in the 45 range in the country. So again, last second field goal for Navy to defeat Kansas state 20 to 17. They should win that game. If we're saying that Navy's a top 25 team, which they finished 25 in my rankings and a little bit higher than that in the other rankings in the national rankings and Kansas state's a top 40 to 45 team. Well, they beat them on a last second field goal. Okay. That's probably what they should do. My uh, computer's going crazy. And I'm not going to dive into Conference USA and the Sun Belt and the MAC. Because especially the MAC got destroyed by the Power Five. That's why you consistently see year to year uh, MAC teams winning the MAC championship with five or six losses. You know, everybody in the MAC, you know, has six losses because they just lost all their games. It was a balanced league, so they were beating each other, but then they lose all their games against the Power Five. They just lost all of them. And I'm exaggerating, of course, off the top of my head, Eastern Michigan beat Illinois. But, okay. Boise State beat Florida State. But Florida State, again, Boise State was all season considered the best or the second best or the third best group of five team. Florida State, I had ranked 59th in the country. So they should win that game. And it was a close game. Air Force had a nice win against Colorado. But again, Air Force, one of the very, very, very best group of five teams playing a Colorado team that I had ranked 57th, something in that range. Air Force beat them in a very good game. Overtime game, overtime game. Utah State lost to Wake. Wyoming beat Missouri. Good win.
if we strictly look at postseason play between the Power Five and the Group of Five, we have... I should go to a different page to do this, uh, but I'm trying to think of these off the top of my head. Washington killed Boise State. Air Force squeaked by Washington State. Close game. North Carolina killed Temple. Uh, Pitt barely beat Eastern Michigan. So credit the group of five there. Louisiana Tech beat uh, Miami. I had Louisiana Tech around 48th in the country and Miami around 58th. And I don't think anyone in the Big Ten. Of course, Penn State beat Memphis. We talked about that game. And other than that, uh, the Navy win over Kansas State at the gun. And I don't think that there were any other games between the group of five and the power five in postseason play. So anyway, it's an interesting conversation, and it's the most difficult thing that I have to do week to week in ranking the top 25, and then it was just expanded about a thousand times because I had to take into account all the power fives and all the group of fives and try to compare. But generally, generally, this is a very general statement, I'm going to rank a seven and five power five at about the same level as a 10 and two group of five. I think that's pretty fair. Mm, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not hitting the comments that I'm trying to put up there. What's going on? Group of five was four and four against the power five in postseason play. Sounds like it from what we just read off. Keep in mind, Matthew, that the very first college football playoff poll that ever came out, the college football playoff rankings, I should say, that came out in 2014 had Ohio State at number 22 the team that eventually won the national championship. All right, everyone, I appreciate you jumping on board. I'm going to let you know that uh, tomorrow I'm going to be recording segments on Miami, a Q&A with a wholesome one, and also with Oregon. So look out for those uh, conversations coming up in the next few days. Uh, I am going to list my... Five surprising teams of 2019, my five disappointments of 2019. I'm going to continue to post uh, conference players of the year videos. Uh, somebody in the live chat wants me to rank the new head coaching hires. I can only get to so much, though. Uh, my week is going to be cut short due to some good things happening in my life. And um, Yeah, I'm going to take the predictions that I made for 2019 and compare them against the results. And you guys can make fun of me as I go through um, how well I did or how not so well I did. 58% though against the spread. If you join me on Patreon, 58% against the spread, 78% uh, straight up against the money line in 2019. Right here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Thank you so much for joining. We will back, be back here live at... 7 o'clock Eastern time on Tuesday night with Florida State Seminoles live. And uh, otherwise, ring that bell for the notifications, and uh, I will be producing content constantly right here at uh, The Voice of College Football.
See you soon.